Uh, uh, test, test. Okay. So it's now three o'clock, so shall we get started? Okay. Um, welcome and thank you for being here uh, today, and also thank you for those who are listening into the YouTube stream of this event. And my name is Naoyuki Yamagishi. Um, um, from Double Japan, and uh, this event is a JCI, Japan Climate Initiatives event to us zero and non state Japanese, non state actors tackling climate crisis. And um, I'm privileged to moderate today's great uh, panelists. And um, before getting into the, today's program, let me give you a few facts about Japan Climate Initiative. JCI was established in 2018, and we started with 105 organizations. Today, we have 672 organizations, and uh, we have a lot of uh, different backgrounds. Uh, those include business, local, governing, go local governments, um, civil society organizations, um, religious groups, youth, and uh, consumer groups, and, uh, and so on. So, over the past three years, we have done a lot of collective work. Um, one of them was just last month, we did the Japan Climate Action Summit, which attracted more than 2,000 audience uh, online. We also did an um, opinion ad on a Japanese major newspaper, in which we asked the Japanese governments to revise NDC, uh, towards a greater ambition. We, have, we believe that our action was catalytic in accelerating decarbonization movement in Japan. And today, uh, we'd like to draw your attention to each member's climate action. And uh, without further ado, let me start with the uh, short video, which includes a message from our members. Realizing a truly sustainable decarbonized society cannot be done by one company or one government alone. It takes a collective effort, including working with our consumers. We believe that Race to Zero is an initiative that can really accelerate our efforts towards this movement globally.は、2050年ネットゼロに向けた取り組みとして、2025年までに生産拠点の9割で再生可能エネルギー電力を導入します。合わせて、バリューチェーン全体における私たちNTTデータはグローバルで様々な人や組織をつなぐことにより新しい社会を築き皆様と共にゼロの達成を進めてまいります。Time Right. So uh, now let's move on to listening to each panel's story. So first, we, I'd like to invite Mr. Hiroshi Ozeki, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer, Nisei Asset Management Corporation. So uh, Mr. Ozeki, I'm going to prepare your presentation and then please start from it. Thank you. Um, just one more minute.
Okay. So, Here we go. All right. Uh, thank you, Yamagishi-san. Uh, my name is Hiroshi Ozeki, CEO of Nisei Asset Management. I'm delighted to be here uh, to speak such, uh, at such a wonderful event. Uh, today, I would like to share with you our journey towards net zero. Next, please. So, uh, Nisei Asset Management uh, is the asset management arm of Nippon Life Group. Our asset under management is Two, uh, 270 billion US dollar. We are the largest asset manager in the Japanese private pension market with over 500 institutional clients. Next, please. I will touch upon the history of our commitment to ESG. We signed up a PRI in 2006 and started our ESG integration in 2008. We have announced our endorsement of TCFD in 2019 and joined the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative this March, uh, the second uh, signer in Japan. We have also served as the first ever Japanese lead sponsor of PRI Digital Conference held just last month. The number of people registered in this conference is huge, more than 6,000 which is more than everyone expected. Next, please. Uh, our ESG approach in long-term investment. This slide illustrates the concept of our ESG integration. We, wo fo we focus on ESG factors that are not only good for the environment and society, but also relevant to corporate sustainability and value. By reflecting the financial impact of ESG factors in our long-term financial forecast, we can calculate corporate value that incorporates ESG factors and use it to make better investment decisions. Next, please. This chart shows you the performance by our ESG rating. The difference in stock price performance between companies with our high ESG ratings and those with low ESG rating tends to widen over the time. We believe that our ESG ratings are working very well. A good investment for the future on the title is a basic concept that I value to manage our company. Good means uh, we aim to invest not only in the performance for our customers, but also in the environment and society. Future means the future of our customers and the future of the earth. Next, please. Here is an analysis of environmental E rating among our ESE ratings. The graph shows the spread between the stock performance of companies with higher E rating and those with lower E rating. Until 2014, the stock performance with a higher E rating was not excellent. However, the trend completely changed in 2015. Many of you uh, may recognize the year 2015. It was the year that the Paris Agreement was adopted. We believe that the Paris Agreement has strengthened the positive link between corporate value and environmental factors. Next, please. Here is a chart uh, that shows the relationship between ESG ratings and credit ratings for each year from 2014 to 2020. You can see that lower ESG rating of the beginning of the year, the more companies are downgraded in credit rating at the end of the year. As is often said, ESG consideration will work for downside protection. It is now clear that our ESG ratings are effective not only for equity investment, but also for credit investment. Next, please. Usually, the process of our ESG investment is to pick up ESG leaders, leader companies with good corporate performance. We showed, we showed you our ESG investment excellent performance in the previous slide. However, investing in ESG leaders is not enough. 
to achieve the net zero goal as a whole world. Now, it becomes very important not only to invest in ESG leaders, but also to encourage ESG laggards going toward net zero through engagement. <clears throat> as a responsible investor, we continue to increase our ESG investments, but at the same time, we pursue more in impact investment and transition finance to create an impact on sustainability, especially towards the net zero realization. Next, please. Here we will talk about the ESG investment activities of Nippon Life, our parent company. Nippon Life considers ESG in all asset classes of 72 trillion yen or about 630 billion US dollars. As a member of Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, Nippon Life aims to achieve Net Zero by 2050. Nisi Asset Management has also started managing impact funds in collaboration with Nippon Life. Next, please. As an example of impact investment, Nippon Life invested in a fund managed by an affiliate of TPG Capital to solve the environmental and societal issues last year. And on the right hand side, Nippon Life also invested in the Next Rise Social Impact Fund this July. This social impact bond fund is to solve social issues while reducing administrative costs by entrusting businesses to private con contractors. The government sector pays compensation according to the degree of achievement in solving social issues. And the fees to us will be paid according to those compensation. We will pursue various impact investment opportunities furthermore. Next, please. At the end of my presentation, I will show you Nippon Life Group have been working on forestation since 1992. Now, this forestation has expanded to 200 locations across Japan, absorbing CO2 emissions, purifying water, and prevented the outflow of soil as described on this page. Along with these initiatives, we, NIS Asset Management, will continue to focus more on impact and would like to contribute to build a sustainability future for us and for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ozeki. And um, it's uh, great to hear that the, uh, the performance of the ESG is actually reflected in the performance of the, uh, you know, the, the companies themselves. Thank you very much. So now we would like to uh, invite Mr. Hidenao Makiuchi, uh, Managing Director of uh, Deutsche Life International Europe. Um, let me change the presentation right now. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, you know, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, precious opportunity. To uh, I'm delighted to be able to uh, you know talk about what we are doing. Um, in this, uh, you know, on-site at COP26. Um, before going to, into the next slide, uh, let me, you know, briefly uh, touch upon what Daiichi is about. Daiichi Life is obviously a life insurance uh, company, uh, which is one of the largest life insurance companies in Japan. And uh, in the past 15 years, we have expanded our business into uh, you know global arena we have uh, currently eight uh, eight overseas businesses uh, outside japan and uh, myself have been deeply involved in the global expansion of the Daichi life group and you know recently the Daichi life group is very active uh, in you know esg or climate change and so before going to, to the next slide what, so let me ask some, you know, question. Uh, what do you think about what uh, a life insurance company has to do with climate change? 
And yeah, the answer is the next slide. Um, you know, we, you know, the life insurance industry has two, basically two aspects uh, in terms of climate change. The first one is about, you know, underwriting of insurance business. This is about, so about uh, business operation itself. And the second, on the right, side, on the right hand side, it is about investment. And so we have two aspects, and, but uh, we put, I put some numbers here. We calculated our, our carbon footprint of our business activities. On the left side, uh, you know, the scope one and two, and also scope three, excluding category 15, which is investment, is 0 0.24 uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent. But on the other side, on the other hand, investment is very big. It's like a, about 6.64 million tons of CO2 equivalent, which is much larger than the, the left hand side. So, um, in terms of climate change or in carbon footprint, um, you see the investment it has a very very big uh, impact on the society. So, we the key to, for the uh, insurance companies, life insurance companies to tackle with climate change is about investment. Um, having said that, um, it is also very important to, you know, uh, tackle with the, you know, our own business. So we have set, uh, we, ha we made a pledge to, to, you know, uh, to be net zero for our own business by 2040. Uh, and also, in terms of investment, we made a pledge uh, to, to reduce, uh, to, to achieve net zero of our investment portfolio by 2050. So, next page, please. Yeah. And, as I said, uh, we Create uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, but um, you know, we I show here uh, the the breakdown of a carbon footprint in our investment portfolio. You see, you know, domestic equities and domestic domestic corporate bonds are the largest uh, emitter uh, in our portfolio. But the point here is not the figures itself, but uh, you know. In order to consider uh, the, you know, setting the target of a reduction of carbon footprint, we need to be prepared to calculate the carbon footprint uh, of our portfolio. And we need to analyze and we need to set strategy to reduce carbon footprint. And so we did it uh, two years ago, uh, well, uh, one year ago. And so now, after Calculating the carbon footprint, we set an uh, intermediate target of reduction of a carbon footprint uh, by 25% uh, by uh, 2025. And in order to uh, you know, make our commitment more transparent and concrete, credible, we joined uh, asset, Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, as Ozek um, mentioned before the case of that Nippon Life. Um, what it means to be a member of alliances? It is obviously an internal coalition of asset owners, and may, may all the members are committed to net zero. And so we need to be, make a commitment to, to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2050. And also, we need, you need to set interim target every five years. And yeah, this is uh, Daichi Life's, uh, you know, activity in, in Net Zero. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Makiuchi-san. Um, next, I'd like to invite Mr. Takeo Omori, ESG analyst, responsible investment group, asset management one. He's, gonna, he's not going to use presentation, so I'm going to just show the title slide. For the introduction, I'm Takeo Omori of Asset Management One. Asset Management One is one of the largest asset managers in Japan. 
uh, with approximately 516 billion US dollars in AUM. Uh, I am an ESG analyst of a responsible investment group in charge of ESG engagement and relationship with uh, international initiatives like uh, Climate Action 100 Plus or Net Zero Asset Management Initiative for access to medicine and so on. And I've been participating in uh, various sessions here at COP26. And uh, the message of Net Zero uh, has been strongly emphasized. So I'm going to focus on Net Zero uh, today. Uh, the movement to achieve net zero by 2050 is accelerating around the world. Uh, in the asset management industry, uh, following Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, which was established in 2019 for asset owners, Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, a global initiative to achieve net zero for asset managers, was established in December last year. Asset Management 1 endorses the aims of the initiative and uh, was the only Japanese asset manager uh, to have joined the initiative as one of the 30 founding signatories uh, at the launch. As the number of signatories to Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative has increased from 30 at the beginning to 220 as of last week's announcement. Uh, it is just less than a year after the launch. And uh, the total AUM has grown to approximately uh, 57 billion US dollars, uh, which I think is o over 50% of total global AUM. Efforts to achieve net zero in the asset management industry are rapidly expanding. Also, Asset Management One is the only Asian member of uh, Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative's advisory group, which consists of six asset managers that are consulted by the uh, steering committee. And actually, I am a member of the advisory group and support the initiative. Last week, the interim targets were released for 43 asset managers, including the 30 founding signatories. And asset management one's interim target for 2030 is to aim for 273 billion US dollars, which is 53% of our total AUM to be in line with the net zero scenario in 2030. This is an extremely ambitious target but it is also an expression of our determination to set a high target and move toward it. As the world shifts toward net zero, we believe that it is essential for us as a responsible investor uh, to strive to align our assets with the net zero goal. This is not only essential to solve social issues, but also essential for us to capture new business opportunities. I would like to briefly mention the three points that we will be working on to support the shift to net zero as an asset management company. First is to increase assets which are in line with the net zero scenario. And those products need to be supported by as many customers as possible. Those products include not only active funds, but also, also passive funds. Second, on the engagement with investee companies, which uh, we have been doing for a long time, uh, we will more actively encourage uh, investee companies to change uh, their business models toward net zero. Thirdly, Asset Management One will strengthen various initiatives to achieve net zero by 2050 in cooperation uh, with government and uh, other related organizations and also other asset managers. Achieving net zero in 2050 and 
our interim target in 2030 is very ambitious goal. We cannot achieve it by ourselves. So we believe we need to work with other stakeholders in the investment chain and get together, move the whole society forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Omori. Um, next, I'd like to invite Mr. Masahiro Takahashi, uh, General Manager, Environment Group, NYK Line. Let me prepare your presentation. I want to stand up and uh, make a presentation because I don't have my eyes on the back. Oh, the uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Sorry about this. So uh, let me start that the uh, NYK line is a uh, shipping company. And uh, shipping company uh, uh, GAG emission from the shipping company is not a part of the Paris Agreement. The, since the Kyoto Protocol, the, the international shipping and the international aviation uh, were considered as a, uh, outside of Kyoto Protocol because of the difficulty for the categories. Uh, uh, so please, if go to the second page. Yes. Just make it smaller. The just one page is not visible. It's a little too big. Yes. 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 Why the uh, international shipping is not included in the uh, Paris Agreement is that uh, we are carrying the cargo uh, from different countries. Uh, for example, that if we carry the iron ore from Brazil to China by a Japanese company, and the ship is owned by the Singaporean companies, but uh, it is registered to Panama, such situation always happening. So nobody wants to get the CO2 emission, right? Neither Brazil or no, China or Singapore or even Japan. And uh, we are the work, uh, you know, that the, the shipping is an international business. Then we can carry the, any cargo from any countries to anywhere. So uh, because of that reason that uh, UNOFCCC uh, you know, asked IMO, it is an uh, uh, agency of the United Nations uh, specialized for the shipping uh, you know, to handle the GAG issue by ourselves. So, next slide, please. And uh, IMO's initial GAG strategy uh, was. Uh, uh, concluded, agreed at MEPC 70 in 2018, I think. Uh, and, uh, it, but it was uh, in line with the two degrees ambition, uh, which was, you know, no more the time. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, uh, to make that agreement, there is a uh, big uh, dispute, uh, discussion, argument, uh, because of the uh, difference of the two uh, principles. As I said, that uh, we are international shipping is fighting in the same market worldwide. So we, are, we have uh, uh, one principle that no more favor treatment principle, which I, we quote, 
That is, the, all ships, either it is registered to Japan or the United States or any country, that the same regulation should apply. On the other hand, that the Paris Agreement's principle is uh, CBDR, common but different responsibility, depends on the progress of the economic growth. So that is, there is a big conflict. Well, the, somehow we managed to agree the, for the interim uh, 2030 midterm the targets and long-term targets. So at the time of the MPC 70, we agreed uh, that the uh, short-term target in the 2030 is uh, uh, on the energy efficiency basis, 40% uh, reduction compa uh, comparing to 2008. And as midterm, that by 2050, 70% uh, uh, efficiency improvements and uh, absolute, absolute dif, uh, dif, uh, target as 50% in uh, gross volume. Then, uh, as then to uh, aim to uh, uh, net zero uh, within a century as soon as possible. But uh, uh, this is. Uh, 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 next slide, please. And to achieve that uh, two degrees uh, target, uh, since MEPC, uh, at MEPC, we have been discussing how to achieve and they introduced uh, several the measures to achieve. Uh, you know that uh, since the age of the Kyoto Protocol, the uh, international shipping started the uh, the, uh, how to achieve the, uh, how to reduce the uh, fuel emissions uh, in, uh, in introduced uh, uh, the, the rule so-called EEDI, you know that the, now that the, all the new vessels have to improve their energy efficiency every five years, 5% 5 or so on, and by that, that you know that the uh, ships Newer ship is always more efficient. Uh, we, uh, such kind of the rule was established already for some years. And, uh, but you know, to achieve the 2030 target, it is not enough as the, there are still the old ships in the market uh, in the 2030, so that we have agreed to introduce the new regulation, so-called the EXI, that the, or, uh, the existing ship already built 10 years ago, have to make the achievement of the same level of the efficiency uh, by introducing the energy efficiency devices or something like that uh, by, uh, from the 2023. This, in new, this new regulation will be introduced. And also that already since a couple of years ago, the all shipping companies, the all ships has to report the uh, uh, miles of the travel and uh, uh, fuels uh, consumed so that the energy efficiency uh, can be uh, easily calculated. That, that reporting system is, uh, has started uh, in a, on an international basis. Uh, please go to the next slide. Uh, and so that uh, we have, you know, we have the uh, agreement for the 2030 goal and the 2050 goal. But uh, as we all understand that, uh, you know, that uh, we think that is not enough, that we should aim uh, 2015 at zero or so on. And that discussion is expected to start from the MEPC uh, 78, which is uh, uh, 77, which is expected to start from the 22nd of November to 26th of November. I myself is a general manager of environment in NYK group, but I am uh, taking a chairman's position of the shipping, uh, Ship Owners Association, Japan Ship Owners Association. And through that uh, capacity, I am, have been working as a member of the offshore Jap Japanese offshore delegation to MEPC since MEPC 70 for already for about four years or so. So that uh, we are, that's the Japan Ship Owners Association and the government have been discussing 
how we should do, uh, how can we do, or so on, uh, for so many years. And uh, we are uh, ready to go to the net zero war target for the 2050 uh, through the discussion starting from MEPC 77. That will take some time. And uh, uh, current, uh, we have agreed a schedule to review uh, the, you know, the, the target uh, by the 2023. So we have a meeting this year one, in November and two meetings in next year. So through this process, international shipping world will agree for the new target, which we hope net zero by 2050. And this is the chairman of the, M the committee, MEPC's chairman. This is Japanese guy, Mr. Saito, from the Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transport. And uh, in this uh, meeting, uh, Japan's position is very unique. Uh, we, uh, what, how can I say that the, uh, Japan is uh, you know, still the third largest uh, economic country uh, our uh, GDP is the third largest. Uh, number one is United States and China, and third is Japan. And uh, ship building capacity, the, we are third in the world. The largest ship building capacity is China, and second is Korea, and third is Japan. And um, by these three countries, to be honest, that is surprising reason. More than 90% of the commercial ships are built. So no ship building capacity in Europe, only for cruise ship. So whatever the European people say, that Japan is the one to build a ship for the growth. And third, that the, uh, as a, the number of the ships owned and operated by Japan is second largest in the world. Number one ship, ship, shipping country is Greece, and Japan is second, close to one by one. Please go next. And uh, among such industrial scheme, uh, NYK is as a leader of the Japanese Shipping Society. Uh, we have been trying to uh, improve our GHG reductions, uh, you know, for so many years. Uh, and uh, in 2018, we have uh, made a uh, new plan. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in line with the uh, Paris Agreement, at two degrees target. And, uh, but, you know, now we have changed our target for 2050. And that, uh, it, of course, it is very difficult, uh, just, but just recently, uh, and, and at the end of September, so we, our president has announced uh, our uh, ambitious target for the 2050 to net zero. And uh, that's why that uh, on the day, last day of the September was chosen was that the October 1st is our foundation day. And so that it is uh, our officers growth. And but the, on the following day, on the second, that the president is every year to making, uh, you know, speech to all our group employees. So that I wanted to include that very important message in that uh, on that on the day. Please go ahead. So, how, uh, how to achieve net zero? It is not uh, import, uh, not easy. Currently, that almost all the fuel uh, ships are using fossil fuel, uh, mostly uh, heavy fuel oil. That is a residue of the you know from the oil, you know the very you know lowest quality part of the of the oil. But it is very good, you know, very powerful, you know, uh, the dense of the energy. And uh, 
then that we have to change to the uh, cleaner one. And uh, it, is, it is said in the market that the ammonia is the future. That because that, you know, uh, uh, everybody say that the hydrogen is a hope. Uh, brown is not good, blue is better, and the green hydrogen is perfect. But the hydrogen is, uh, the, the high calorie of the hydrogen is too low for international shipping for long distance. Then we have to, you know, we have to uh, condense the energy uh, for easier, uh, you know, formats. Then that is the ammonia. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it may take maybe another decade or two decades or so until the inter uh, global network of the ammonia supply chain, green ammonia supply chain is established. But we don't want to wait. And so the our, our decision is to build by a ship the most uh, you know, economical, you know, most eco-friendly ship at the time. And currently, that the uh, LNG fuel ship is considered the most, you know, eco-friendly ship, most, you know, uh, low GAG emission, 25 to 30 percent better than uh, uh, burning the heavy fuel oil. Then that the, uh, but this is a just a, a bridging solution, and so uh, we are thinking as a second step that the uh, ammonia ready to ammonia ready LNG fuel ship that we are studying right now. That's to be converted to ammonia fuel uh, when it is ready. And when that the uh, regulations uh, set up and uh, ammonia fuel ship is commercially available, that means that the uh, shipyard can build on, on a commercial basis. Then we shift to the ammonia fuel ship completely. Then to achieve the 2050 net zero, the meaning that, that we are operating about uh, 700 to 800 ships now, meaning that, that all the ships have to be replaced or have to have a major modification to adapt the uh, zero emission. It's a huge investment that we have to make it happen in the next 20 years or so. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, for that purpose, you know, uh, that is not possible just for ourselves. You know, we are not the shipbuilder. We buy a ship. We ask the shipyard to build. We have to buy fuel. You know, then and so you know that is that so that that zero emission project is. Uh, cannot be achieved by one company, but we are working together with other companies, other shipping company and shipyards and so on, so on, as Japanese, Japan Maritime Cluster. And also that we have, uh, we are the participating in uh, international projects uh, headed by the, the Mask Line uh, so-called the Marsk Machinery and Motor Center of Zero Carbon Shipping, just they had the seminar in Danish pavilion, <laughs> pavilion uh, today that uh, aiming for the uh, zero, net zero by 2050. And so, so that uh, we are working with the Japanese partner and also the international partners to achieve the, the pathway to net zero by 2050. Please go, please go ahead. So, uh, just uh, uh, before coming to Glasgow, NYK was uh, at, nominated by Japanese government uh, for the pioneer, uh, for the project uh, for the ammonia uh, fuel ships uh, subsidized by the Japanese government. And so, uh, we, are work we will be working harder with our partners to, uh, to develop the technology for the ammonia fuel ships, not just for us, but for all of the international shipping 
and this group. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Takahashi, and I apologize for the glitches that I caused at the beginning. And then next, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Megumu Tsuda, Deputy General Manager, Sustainability uh, Promotion Division, Hitachi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yamagishi-san. Uh, is the microphone on? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Meg Tsuda, uh, Working Sustainability Promotion Division of Hitachi Limited. I'm glad to be here to talk about uh, Hitachi Group's contribution to a net zero society. Next, please. Hitachi was launched in Japan 111 years ago by a young engineer, Namihei Odaira, who was determined to change society. His mission was contribute, contributing to society through the development of superior original technology and products, which has never changed, instead become more relevant than ever in the era of the climate challenge. Next, please. Let's see where we are not right now. This slide shows our business portfolio as of March 2021. Hitachi consists of six business sectors, IT, energy, industry, mobility, life, and automotive systems, and some other group companies. This wide coverage of business areas shows our capabilities for innovation in society. Next page, please. As a social innovation leader, environment and climate challenge is one of the biggest agenda for Hitachi to tackle and also could provide a major business opportunities. We aim to be carbon neutral in scope one and two, namely at our offices and factories by 2030. And we recently revised our target to achieve carbon neutrality throughout the value chain by fiscal year 2050. Next page, please. Let me explain a bit more in details how we will make it happen. Looking at Hitachi's GHG emissions, because Hitachi's business is centered on manufacturing long-life electrical products, CO2 emissions associated with use of sold products in scope 3 account for more than 80% of total emissions, and reducing such emissions is crucial to achieve our target of carbon neutrality throughout the value chain. Next page, please. In tackling it, we have two key approaches. First, we reduce the environmental impact of our own operations and the polish, combine, and accumulate expertise. Then we expand such expertise as a business to reduce the environmental impact of, of our customers. This synergy becomes possible thanks to Hitachi's unique capability of having operational technology, IT, and wide range of products. Next, uh, uh, the initial, sorry, coming back, please. The, the initiative include achieving world-class energy efficiency of products by making products that take account of the environment right from the design phase and supporting businesses that contribute to the carbon neutrality of society as a whole, which I will talk about it later. Then developing technologies, and last but not least, engagement with our suppliers on their CO2 reduction plan. So next page, please. So let me give some examples of ongoing businesses. In energy sector, we combine the power grid uh, that supports renewable energy expansion with cutting-edge smart control systems to create cleaner, stronger, more reliable, and secure energy system. Regarding mobility, Hitachi is accelerating the spread of energy-efficient high-speed rails and hybrid trains with storage batteries. We also provide electric vehicle systems and creating and enhancing EV value chain to support the EV market. We also contribute to the decarbonization of our customers' operation by providing our digital platform, Lumada, Lumada Solutions, and helping in reducing CO2 emissions by uh, advancing the digitalization. By utilizing the power of our many businesses and digital innovations, we are working towards a decarbonized society. Next page, please. 
Regarding technology development, we are showcasing R and D capability, our capabilities at blue zone and green zone throughout the duration of COP26. At both zones, you can meet Hitachi people, nice and very sincere, and you can find Hitachi's strength just talking with them. Those who are unable to come to Glasgow, please visit our COP26 website and experience it online. Next page, please. Uh, today, I explained how Hitachi is becoming a climate change innovator. Hitachi decided to take the role of a principal partner at COP26 to demonstrate to the world its strong commitment to achieving this goal. Having said that, however, we cannot do it alone. The only way we can achieve net zero and a cleaner, greener planet is by doing it together. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sadao. Uh, lastly, but not the least, I'd like to invite Mr. Haruhisa Tokito, uh, organizer, Youth for One Nose. Hello. Uh, uh, uh. Hello, everyone. Um, I am a Haruhisa. I am Haruhisa Tokito. I am a member of Youth for One Earth. Um, I, I am sorry if I make some mistake because I can speak English very well. But yeah, um, I will begin my presentation. Now, in the COP, uh, sorry, I don't prepare any presentation, just speaking, sorry. Um, now, in the COP26, um, we are, including me, are disappointed with the COP26. Why? Because the meeting is dedicated to only the people living in developed countries. I usually heard that carbon net zero, but the carbon net zero, what is the meaning? I think net zero is not the truly true zero. For example, the company said net zero and they um, they get the forest um, around the world and then said, yeah, we are net zero because I get the I got the forest and the forest will um, the forest will get the CO2. But this is truly net zero. I I'm worried about about if um, the situation if the there is a situation um, maybe the situation will cause the conflicts between the companies and the people the local people living in there. It is not just it is not just a um, very great solution. I think. I think the carbon zero means to um, means to get rid of any social issues, I think. So please be careful to say net zero, I think. And I was also disappointed the Japanese attitude. I I heard in this COP the prime Japanese Prime Minister um, Kishida says we uh, we Japan are the have a leadership about climate change and we we use the coal fire plant with high technology for example with hydrogen and ammonia but I don't think so that Japanese has a leadership about climate change. If Japan has a leadership, 
Japan should say to increase the renewable energy at first. So um, I, I think, um, I rethink, I want to rethink and the uh, readership, what is readership, I think. And then I am, um, we are very, very anxious about tackling with 1.5 Celsius degrees target. I can't understand why the leader around the world uh, won't talk with the 1.5 Celsius degrees at the COP. We are very, very worried about the future because we, we will live in the future, especially. But the situation is not enough, I think. The measure, um, the current measure decides the next future, but the people um, now, the attendees in the COP won't talk about that. Yeah. Um, we have a strong um, depression about worried because, yeah, for example, some of my members, the youth, says that we won't bear my children. We don't need our children. Why? Because um, I, I don't want my children to live the next dark future. Yeah, so uh, the people living, living in, the, in the world, including me, have a responsibility to, to create the next bright future. Yes, and what I, what I put emphasis on is to focus on MAPA. The MAPA means most affected people and area, not only in Japan or something, but also all over the world, like um, developing countries and living in the global south and so on. I think it is not enough to include the MAPA, not including, including, but also being central, central. So I want to, um, I want to, I want hope the system change to be um, that the MAPA can be in the central in the meeting. And I want to tell you about the world of Earthring. Do you know Earthring? Earthring means people, not the, the living things, not only in develop, developed countries, but also developing countries and uh, people living in the global south animals, plants, microbes, and so on. It means uh, the living things all over the world. I think the COP26 will, will be dedicated to answering. So, but Today, until today, the COP26 isn't, um, isn't sufficient because it is not for us ring. Please focus on um, not developed countries, but living things all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Tokito. That was a refreshingly challenging statement from the youth. Um, so uh, let me use the rest of the time to dig deep, a little bit deeper into the stories of the panelists. And um, uh, let me throw two questions. Um, my first question goes to uh, Mr. Ozeki. 
and Mr. Um, Makiuchi, and also Mr. Omori. Um, we've been observing the rising tide of financial sector in, 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 Jap in Japan. Um, it's been astonishing, and um, all of you have joined there's some sort of net zero initiatives in, in Japan, uh, from in, in international, uh, and some some call them as the G fans at this point. And this is uh, very unusual for Japanese institutions, actually. And uh, let me ask you, what motivated you to join these net zero initiatives? Uh, first, uh, could I ask you uh, to answer this question, Mr. Ozeki? Yes. So thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for Yamagi-san. Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, uh, I prepared a, a presentation, I mean, slides for here, and uh, I often said that uh, as the old skies and all the oceans on the earth are common and connected, no border. So uh, it is a matter of cooperation uh, with our neighbors in order to keep our precious planet safe and sound for our future generation. It is critical, universal issue, and apparently a matter of collaboration within entire investment chain, with more participants having the same goal and aspiration, will bring about better and better results. So this is one of the reasons why uh, we joined in the initiative at the first place. Next, please. And uh, next, second reason is a growing trend among many countries, including Japan, to commit the carbon neutrality is also encouraging us investors. As this chart shows, most of the country with high CO2 emissions committed carbon neutral. Next, please. And we believe that uh, there are many business and investment opportunities in achieving carbon neutrality. Innovations are uh, occurring in energy sources, production and storage, transportation, supply, and energy utilization. Apparently, these are good for the planet as well as, as good for our investment return. Please, next please. So lastly, but not the least, we must not forget the importance of collaboration throughout the investment chain. By collaborating and engaging with the companies, asset owners, and beneficiaries, we believe to contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and, in turn, to the realization of a decarbonized society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ozeki. And, and that the same question to Mr. Makiuchi. Yeah. Uh, could I ask you to... Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I also prepared some, uh, just two slides. Government level, trend one two is obvious, uh, probably all of you, uh, because trend one is about a net zero commitment from government and setting NDC target, and also this trend is uh, you know uh, moving from Europe to other regions. And in terms of insurance industry, I see the the same uh, or similar is happening in, in, the, in the industry. Uh, uh, you know, in Europe, a target setting for you know, investment portfolio is uh, almost complete uh, for European insurance companies. And this is also starting to happen uh, in other regions. And in, in trend four, in terms of trend four, it is about value chain engagement. This is also obvious. And the today's topic is about trend five, which is alliance. 
And so, we, uh, as many of uh, us are saying, that say that uh, we cannot do alone. We need to be uh, collaborative uh, when we, uh, if we want to achieve a net zero uh, by 2050. So, um, alliance is uh, the trend. So what I thought, what we thought was that this trend will come to Japan sooner or later, maybe in, in one year or two years time frame. And so we don't want to be, you know, get behind. We don't want to be passively, you know, reacting to the trend. We wanted to proactively, um, you know, uh, act uh, now. Not, not later. So we, as I see the trend, and so we uh, wanted to be the first mover to be, you know, to join the alliance. And the next page, please. Um, here you see the, you know, the G Fund is uh, the kind of umbrella of alliances. Uh, Daichi is a member of Net Zero Asset on Alliance, and the as uh, Nisei and uh, you know, Asset Manager One is a member of Net Zero Asset Manager Initiatives, and G Funds is covering all of these alliances. And the Finance Day of COP26 last week, uh, in the Finance Day, um, G Funds was highlighted, and I feel that G Funds is uh, now the key and the leading uh, organization of financial industry uh, globally. And I personally, I'm personally is a, a, a steering group of G Fund's uh, principal meeting. So I am personally, you know, deeply involved in the G Fund's activities. And so my first, I, you know, I have some uh, last words uh, to the audience, uh, you know, I really encourage, if you are a financial institution, uh, you are working in the financial industry, I would really you know, encourage you to join us uh, to be a member of our alliance. And by doing so, uh, I, please uh, join us to, the, to the, the long journey to our net zero together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Makiuchi. Um, Mr. Omori, um, what is your case? That uh, people understand the need to achieve net zero by 2050. However, uh, it's quite difficult to find concrete ways to achieve this goal at this point. In our case, about 60% of our total assets are passive funds. So, how to achieve uh, net zero for passive funds? It is quite difficult question. Since passive funds invest in the entire market or the whole society move toward net zero. enough for only some individual companies or services to achieve net zero. The entire world needs to shift to a decarbonized society. In order to achieve this goal, I don't think it is possible to reach it by working very hard just by one company. Uh, it is very complex and interconnected issue. So uh, if you think that we need to move society as a whole, um, it will be essential to work with other stakeholders. Uh, including the uh, investee companies, asset owners, uh, retail investors, governments, and uh, of course, other asset managers. Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative is an initiative to work with other asset managers to move towards net zero. By participating in this initiative, we thought but, uh, we will we, we'll have a better chance of achieving this difficult goal of net zero than we do it by ourselves. Asset Management One was the first Japanese asset manager uh, who joined the initiative. We thought it would be important 
to set a high goal, very ambitious target, and encourage various stakeholders in Japan to work on it. We also agreed with the idea that uh, divestment is not a solution. Yes, we can achieve net zero in our portfolio by just divesting companies that are in their efforts for climate change. But we don't think it is a solution. Even if we divest them, as a asset managers buy them. So uh, I think it will be meaningless for society as a whole. So we focus on engagement. We encourage companies that are lagging behind so that the whole society can move toward net zero. As most of you might know, uh, the former Vice President Al Gore mentioned an uh, African saying in, in his speech when he received the uh, prize in 2007. It is, uh, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you are, go together. In order to achieve net to go far, very far, so we need to get together. The number of signatories to Net Zero Asset Initiative has increased significantly for over half of the total global AUM. Japanese asset managers joined the initiative, which is very encouraging. But actually, I, yes, I expect more asset managers, more Japanese asset managers to join us going forward. That's what the society needs. That's what the world needs. We hope to go further uh, by having more forces working together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Omori. And, um, let me just say that this is quite encouraging to see all of these financial institutions joining from Japan, joining the international initiatives at this early stage. So um, it's quite uh, encouraging and also um, empowering uh, from the Japanese uh, external observer perspective. Uh, thank you. And uh, my second question goes to Mr. Takahashi, Ms. Tsuda, and Mr. Tokito. Um, you come from all the different backgrounds. And so let me ask you this question. What are your highest expectations from COP26? What do you expect most from this COP26? Mr. Takashi? Uh, thank you. Uh, so this is my first time to attend COP meetings. Although I attended uh, so many meetings of the IMO, MEPC, so that uh, the, the negotiation place for the, by the all the member states. And uh, so I'm so surprised and encouraged to attend here as the COP is yeah, the passion. You know, I, f I got so much passion from here that, uh, that the, uh, really that the so many countries and so many the, uh, people is uh, really seriously thinking about that future. As uh, all the people here in this room that they have a clear view for the pathway for the net, uh, uh, net zero by 2050, although that is uh, different by people. But looking back the situation in Japan, I feel that the, there are some difference. I feel that some companies are you know, proactively working hard uh, to achieve the net zero goal but some companies are forced to walk or just uh, unwillingly following, you know, that, that the pace of work is so different. The, how to bring the passion back to Japan, to make an inference uh, to all the uh, private sectors and also the government sectors to work harder, that is the uh, very important thing that I, I felt here. 
And uh, as the many people said here, that the, it is not achievable by one company. The, it is, the, you know, that as the, all the business are working by the big supply chain now, therefore the shipping company, the, you know, that the, we are operating ship. We buy fuel, but we are not able to build ship by ourselves. We have to ask shipyards to build. And the shipyard has to buy engines from the engine manufacturers. There's so many manufacture, so many machinery from the various suppliers, and the fuel that someone has to make uh, zero emission fuel. But it is not supplied by one location, but it has to be global because the ships are working, traveling all over the world. So that we have to have dozens of the major ports have to have the supply system. That kind of thing is, you know, that we, we, I know that it is necessary, you know, because I'm in the, in the delegation, but we have to, you know, uh, announce or we have to make such information more in common. That's how I felt. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Sudat, um, what is your highest expectation? Okay, thank you very much. As principal partner, of course, we would like the COP26 to be successful. But on the, we appreciate that the strong leadership of each state. And of course, right now, the detailed negotiation on the mechanism of Paris Agreement is still going on at a separate room. But uh, I would like to define my uh, expectation or on success as a collaboration and innovation outside negotiation room. So according to the provisional list uh, provided by the UNFCCC, COP26 is the most well-attended COP in history. 40,000 people registered. And I hope that such diverse participants have chances to exchange their views, ideas, strongness, or weakness, and at, at this venue to find a way uh, to collaborate to realize a net zero society. For example, this Japan Pavilion is a very unique place where it showcases the uh, uh, latest environmental technologies of various companies. And uh, Hitachi also showcases our latest uh, technologies here and UK Pavilion and the Green Zone as well. I hope there will be a lot of constructive and innovative discussions here and there. And I myself had a chance to have a dialogue with one of the youth members this time, and she gave me a lot of insights. So I think this is one of the wonderful part of COP. My expectation is that more and more dialogue, dialogues between the each participants across countries and across generations and create the opportunities that drives innovation and breakthrough to a net zero society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Takito, your strong words expected. Uh, okay, um, in the last part, um, I forgot to introduce uh, ourselves, our organization. So first, I will give you um, some introdu introduction about my group, and then um, I will explain why I am here and why I have to be here. And then um, I will talk about um, what I thought about COP26. Yeah, um, I am a member of Youth for One Earth, but it is just a platform, and now I belong to Fridays for Future. Um, Fridays for Future was made by Greta Thunberg, and all of the members uh, now are demanding uh, to, to get their um, true, true climate solutions, yeah, to um, improve society, yeah, in terms of climate change. And um, the, 
Next question, why am I here? Um, when I was five, six, or something, uh, when I was an elementary school student, yeah, I was um, interested in forest because um, I lived in the uh, living in the um, area uh, which is surrounded by nature, by forest. And uh, I usually played with my uh, friend in the forest. So uh, I coexisted with the nature. And uh, so, yeah, so I, uh, I got uh, interested in the nature. And then when I was a university student, um, I attended the uh, meeting, yes, about, uh, and the meet in the meeting, uh, the member in Fridays for Future just said, the tipping point is approaching. So we don't have enough time so we have to move something, take some take, um, environmental action immediately. So I decided to participate in Fridays for Future. And then why am I here? Why um, am I in the COP? Because um, I feel the mission that we have to claim um, our voices as a delegate, as a Japanese delegate, as a uh, uh, delegate of youth. By nature, I should be in Japan and I should study in my university, but uh, now I'm absent from my university. And why? The reason is what I said. Yeah, I have a mission and I have to claim to the prime minister and stakeholder, policy makers, the people in Japan to inform our opinion, our thought. And I wanna hope that, I, I wanna hope them to take serious action about climate change. Yeah, and what I hope in the crime in the COP26 is just that um, please hear our, please listen to our voices. Yeah, as I said, all of the youth think um, highly, so thinks highly of climate change. So um, I, f I feel strongest um then then danger yeah about in the future and the, about the future and i think the cop is very very important i'm the, on the verge of living or death yeah so yeah and i am just a delegate but um it is uh, i I didn't be, I, no, no, no. Uh, I wasn't be selected because um, in the Japan, a lot of students, a lot of youth can go there because of the coronavirus pandemic and just a student. So um, it was, uh, I planned that some junior high school student would go there but they can't because they are too young. So w we, including me, have to claim our voices as a delegate. And um, I have to um, take an um, uh, environmental movement to move the leader all over the world. So um, I hope that all of the readers um, should get very um, serious actions, not just speaking, not just talking with, but please take an action immediately. That's what I hope. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and I sincerely hope those voices are heard. Um, so, in order to close this event, I'd like to get international perspective from um, Ms. Nicolette Butlett, Chief Impact Officer on CDP. Um, Ms. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you. So it's a real pleasure to be with here today. It's, it's been extraordinary to watch the growth of the Japan Climate Initiative. I was there in Tokyo where it was launched. We're very proud of the progress it's made. And, uh, and this year we've seen an extraordinary number of companies in Japan, but also around the world, coming through our platform to disclose. We have over 14,000 companies, city, states, and regions now representing over 65% of market cap coming through the CDP system. And uh, we've heard today about some of the commitments that have been made at the COP, right? We're very clear there's been launches last year, this, um, last week, sorry, 130 trillion of assets under management, making a commitment under GFANS. We've seen the standards, the, the IFRS, um, launch its new International Sustainability Standards Board to what they call rewire, replumb the system of the finance sector. We've seen extraordinary deforestation announcements, all of which are amazing, but what, what we really need to realize is we've got eight years to halve emissions, eight years. So now we need to move those commitments into action. We also have so many companies, I mean, sorry, so many countries with net zero targets, right? You will have heard how many countries are on board. We have over three quarters of global GDP aligned with a net zero by 2050 future. Is that gonna be enough? Not without the help of all of society. So non-state actors, the companies, the investors on this panel, and absolutely clearly, it needs to be very close to zero. So our youth leader there was entirely right. It, the net does not mean, you, you know, the, the way in which many companies and cities and governments are framing their net zero and seeing the net zero is, is a big net <laughs> and a small zero, right? It's the other way around. It really, really is. The, and, uh, you know, we're very proud to, to run and co-host with WWF with the, the UN Global Compact and with WRI, the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And that really is the gold standard of what, um, of, of what a target aligned with science looks like. And that this year, two weeks ago, launched the net zero standard. We have Hitaki on the, on the panel has committed to one. We've had um, NTT have it an SBT and hopefully we see that ramp up. I really hope those that have set net zero targets you have those independently verified by the Science-Based Targets Initiative to go for a big zero <laughs> and a very small net uh, in reality. We have right now over a thousand companies who have committed to being 1.5 degree target compliant. Over 2,000 companies who are in the full Science-Based Targets Initiative. And over seven, I think we've got 700 companies in the JCI at the moment, and over 130 of those have set a science-based target. And over 60 companies have committed to having their, their energy supply be 100% renewable. We have over 887 Japanese companies disclosing through CDP this year, which is another increase. It's the fifth highest global group of companies across the Indies, um, next to the United States, China, the UK, and Brazil. All positive signals. But again, you know, just one small stat from our, you know, we're from CDP, we love statistics. One small, very scary stat. Um, in our, the first time we brought out a finance sector questionnaire in 2020, banks reported to us that only 49% of them, so that's less than half of banks, actually even measure the impacts of their portfolios on climate, right? 25% of them disclose their emissions. 
So we've got a long way to go because transparency, measurement, you don't start this until you know where the problem is and you need to measure it, you need to disclose it, and then you need to get your targets and your transition plans aligned. It isn't just a market norm to disclose your information. Regulation is coming. It is coming. The standards are coming. Regulation across the world. You will have seen the United Kingdom's government just announced that they will not only make net zero alignment mandatory, they are going to make net zero transition plans mandatory and that you have to report against them. So that means your target and how you plan to achieve your target, which is really quite extraordinary. And we know that in Japan from 2022, companies listed on the prime market will be required to disclose climate related risks and opportunities, which is great because Japanese companies are already in an excellent position to do so, having been doing our terrible questionnaire for such a long time. I think critically, there is another part to this COP that I have seen is that it's really put nature at the heart of the conversation for the very first time. It has to be at the heart of this. Science has made clear that if we will not get to 1.5 without looking at nature as well, we need that net zero target to be matched with a net nature positive target for nature. Nature generates at least $44 trillion in economic value every single year, yet losses to nature continue at unprecedented rates with three quarters of land and sea altered by people and over a million species threatened with extinction. Overall, the global net zero goal, as I've said, needs to be matched by an equally clear global goal of net positivity, which requires eliminating nature loss, restoring being well underway by 2030, moving us to a, posit a nature positive e economic system by 2050. I heard someone say this morning, this has to be the decade of execution and accountability. We've had decades of strategy. In reality, we've got eight years to halve emissions, and the latest UN report shows that the nationally determined contributions will have us rise emissions by 16% by 2030. So in eight years, we have to significantly drop that curve. And we have to put nature at the heart of it. I look forward to working with you, with the people on this panel and people in the room to making that eight years halving of emissions a reality. Thank you. Thank you, um, Nikki. Um, so we got a lot of homework to do, but um, now for now, uh, join me to give the excellent panelists a round of applause and to and to bring back the momentum together to the back home Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining, joining us.